Welcome to this month's episode of the Strong Family, Strong People live stream from Kathy Reichel Speaking Services. In this episode, we explore family dynamics and answer your questions live in text chat. Now presenting our host, author, counselor, and speaker, Kathy Reichel. Hello, thank you and welcome. This is Kathy Reichel and we're gonna have some fun today. I'll be answering your questions and I'm coming from the place of strong families that build strong people. And I have a book out called Tips for Living Well Together, Strong Family, Strong People. That's right up there. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but I'd like to start off with a word of prayer and then get right into the questions. We have a lot of them today. Heavenly Father, thank you for helping us to have this time be a useful time, that it will be sensible and that it will be profitable. Thank you for being with us and for taking your Holy Spirit and your love for everyone and making these simple answers to the questions something that people can use. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, first question is, what is the best way to keep the lines of communication open with my children and spouse, especially on sensitive topics? Oh, I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's true, is to pray. Um, to keep lines open, you pray. You pray for and with each other. And you pray for real things. You pray for uh, the tests that the kids have and the clothes that you might be shopping for and the meeting that dad has and the report that maybe mom has due. But the more you know about each other and care about each other, the more open your communication can be. And then just one other thing, um, Watch being critical because that will just clog up a line in a second. If you need to confront someone on something, do it. And remember that the formula is three to one with compliments to the confrontation subject. At least two, at least one to one. At least start off with, I really love you and this is important to me and I need to talk to you about that. Or normally you're just so fabulous about this, but I need to talk to you about whatever they're doing. Um, and if you're respectful like that, rather than coming off critical right from the very beginning, that can help keep communication lines on up. And then also be honest, be appreciative, be loving generally. Um, and when you confront, confront, look them right in the eye and respectfully give them a compliment or two or three first. Then say what's going on that you don't like, how it makes you feel. And then last, tell them what you'd like for them to do instead with as few words as possible. Um, okay, that's good enough for that one. My son routinely leaves his wet socks from track practice stuffed inside his shoes. I've asked several times for him to not do this. No result. Oh my, the smell, hell. Um, kids a lot of times respond very well to tools. Um, you've asked him several times. Well, he's just not thinking of it. He's absolutely wasted after track. You just run, 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 run. His heart's probably beating. He's talking to, to the guys. So I would help him out. I would go to Walmart or Costco and get a big old box of Ziplocs, especially the Ziploc that have the zipper top, and put them in his track bag, his clothing bag. Then when he takes a shower and whatever, take those socks, put them in the bag, and put the bag in his, his duffel bag. And then when you, when you hand him the baggies, Give him a big kiss and say, good, now this will help you do that. And if he still doesn't do it, then you need to just sit down and let him know how important it is to you. Okay? My husband and I are working hard on a project together. It's exciting, but now dominating all our conversations. My heart feels neglected. How can I respectfully turn the conversation to another topic? Um... First of all, congratulations that you have a, a, a project that's interesting to both of you. That's terrific. I would say, think of something interesting to you that would also be interesting to him. And then have like a nice summary statement after you've talked for a few minutes about that and say, well, that about sums it up for today. I'd like to change the subject now too. And then you bring up the subject. It's bothering you and it's not bothering him. So I think you need to do more work on that. Um, and I think, it, I think your awareness of that is a good thing. So I appreciate you speaking up for your heart. And I think it would be good if you have something else to 
turn the conversation to instead of there being a long silence and him feeling criticized. Okay. My wife is a bit conscious of her, of her weight. She walks, eats carefully and is health minded. Her metabolism, her metabolism is just naturally slow. What can I do to help her feel beautiful? She's working so hard. Well, you probably already do because you seem like you're very tuned into her, but just tell her. Um, also gossip is so powerful. If you can compliment her in public where you're not talking to her at all, you're talking to some people about her and work a wonderful compliment in there about how lovely she is or how much you enjoy just looking at her. Um, and also when you pray with her, let God know how beautiful you think she is. It's, that's a very powerful kind of gossip that I, I think may get to her heart. Now you don't tell me how overweight she is. Is she uh, uh, that, that vanity 10 pounds or is, is she 70 pounds overweight? and endangering her health. Uh, there is a book called The Fast Metabolism Diet uh, that we tried in our household and it was fabulous and you get to eat a lot. So I can recommend that as something that I've tried and has worked. Um, and there, there may be others, but she may need for you to agree with her if her weight is dangerous to her health. So I don't know what, what situation you're in. So I'll give you the, those two ideas. Okay, next. My boyfriend and I have been having breakthroughs in our communication. Wonderful. It delights my heart. I want to show him how much I appreciate all his effort, but I'm not sure how, how to show or express that. Ideas? Hmm. Well, you can, you write very well. It delights your heart. I imagine you show that. And I imagine if, if you're truly having a breakthrough, um, that his heart is delighted too, or at the very least relieved, um, I would say if, if you feel like if you're a gift giver and you want to give a gift, maybe make his favorite meal with a little sweet card. Thank you for, for the breakthrough that we've had in our, in our talks. Um, and then you say all his effort. And I'm not sure what that is, uh, but to articulate what he's done, the, the extra time you've put into it, the extra attention you've given to it. You could put that in your card but be very specific about what he's given and what, what you appreciate about that. Okay. My dad passed away and left me a painting. I cherish it. Now my sister has asked for it and she's upset that I've not simply given it to her. How can I gently communicate that I'd really like to keep it? Well, I can tell you're a very sweet person and you don't like to disappoint others. Uh, there may not be a gentle way to communicate that to her if she's insistent. And there may be a habit of you getting walked on or your, your desires not being considered because maybe you're a younger sister or a baby sister or what it may be. You've just been very kind. But I think if that is the case, now would be a good time for you to take a stand for yourself. But do communicate very clearly with her that the that the painting isn't just one you like on the wall, it's precious to you. And he gave it to you and it would break your heart to give it away. And you don't think that that's the right thing to do. And if she pitches a fit, let her pitch a fit. Her anger counts for one. Your anger counts for one. Her disappointment counts for one. Your disappointment counts for one. But stick up for yourself. That's all I know from what you've written anyway. Okay, next one. My daughter is going through the terrible twos. Right now I'm having such a tough time with the, with the word no. Oh yeah, with her. Nothing I try seems to work. She just won't mind. What can I do? Yes, the terrible twos and the, the, the word no. Uh, when I had my three, I carefully avoided the word no when they were toddlers because it's so powerful that they really, really, really pick up on it and they will start stomping their little feet and saying no back to you. But I would say instead, uh, let me, uh, how about this one? And I, I would take the plant that she was about to grab and put a toy in her hand. Or if she had a toy that she was about to put in her mouth that she could swallow, then I would grab that and say, here's one instead. And so the substitution is very, very important. And it's good to have a little stash of things you can substitute that they won't swallow or kill. Um, 
also it it does take some extra energy and just n knowing some things that just are her job at two is to test you because at two everybody tells you what to do and you're little and you don't have a lot of power so your job is to figure out who really means what they say and who's just kind of talking baby talk to you so when you when you give her an instruction and she doesn't do it i go back to the toilet training in less than a day the wonderful wonderful steps Number one, you don't give an instruction unless you're within arm's reach. Number two, if they don't readily follow your instruction, you may, you go, you put your hands on them gently and manually guide them so that they complete the task that you tell them to do. Then you have them practice it again and again and again. And every time they do it right, you clap. And when they do it wrong, you manually assist them. And then in the end, you tell them how proud they are that they're doing it right now. Uh, what I don't like is for people to thank a toddler or a child for doing what you ask them to do. I mean, unless it's something like, would you go out in the yard and, and pick me five flowers? And then they bring you flowers. Oh, you how beautiful. But if you say you need to go to bed now, you don't say thank you for going to bed. They're not doing you a favor. They're, obeying, they're following an instruction or obeying a command. So I don't like thank. Uh, sometimes I hear a lot of thank yous and if somebody's talking to a young child and they say honey twice in one sentence and then thank them for doing it, I just don't think that's good for the kids. They get the wrong idea of who's powerful and who's not. And it's, you, we owe it to the kids to be very clear about what power they have and what power they don't have. And I don't know where you are with physical punishment. Uh, I was brought up with a group and it was very successful for me that we had, uh, was it spare the rod and spoil the child? Well, the rod is not a baseball bat. It is a, a small wooden spoon about this long with a little, uh, what is it, the, the mouthpiece on this end. And if they didn't obey, you didn't say, you better do this, you better do this. I'm going to count to 10. They get one pop right on the rear end. And it's not to hurt, but it's to let them know that you mean it and that you'll follow up. Um, so if you do, otherwise, with some children, all you need to do is give them an eyeball and say, do it, and they will. And sometimes they'll even cry. And so, but some of them, you really do need to get their attention. And that's the purpose of the spoon is not to punish them or beat them, but to get their attention. Okay. What would make my mother choose to work over being home with me? Specifically, you know, what would make my mother choose to work over being home with the family, specifically me, and leaving me with my brother who abused me? This is a very serious one, and I don't know the parameters of it. Um, and I, you didn't mention if there's a father in the house, so I'm assuming that there's not. Um, so what, what would make my mother choose to go to work? I don't know if it's a necessity or if it's something that she enjoys doing. And it's just feeling like you're old enough to take care of yourself. I also don't know how old you and your brother are. But your brother abused you. Now, I don't know. Did he try to rape you or did he just call you a jerk? I, I'm not sure what that means to you. Um, but at any rate, your heart is hurting and you're feeling unimportant. And you need to talk to somebody lots more than just me giving you an answer to a quick question. Um, talk to your mother and ask her that question. And does she know about the abuse? And if you don't feel like you can talk to your mother, you need a counselor. You need to talk to someone at school or someone that you trust. And you should not be left alone with a brother that abuses you ever. Um, but I don't know any more than that. It's just very important that you talk to someone. Talk to your mother first and then talk to someone else if she doesn't help you. I have twin boys, age five. Oh my, you are working hard. They are generally good, but recently one has taken to throwing food at his brother, thinking it's funny. My husband just tells me they're boys and let and lets them get away with it help um i don't know if your husband has gotten the attitude that you are on the boys too much 
Um, but at any rate, you and dad need to stand together on things like this, or as they get older, they'll play one against the other. You don't have to agree wholeheartedly on everything, but you don't want to contradict each other in front of the kids. Um, yeah, throwing food won't cut it at three or four or five or 25 for that matter. Um, so with, without your husband's help, because you're with the boys most of the time, I would say, take the food out of his hand, look him, grab his little shoulders, look him right in the eye and say, that is not acceptable. Don't throw food. Do you understand? And then get him to say, yes, I understand mommy or shake his head or okay. Then if he does it again, which you probably will, because he'll probably test you at least once, at least once, and then be as close as you can be to him. And you're the cook and you're his mom. So you'll probably know if a meal is, is really temptingly throwable or not. But if you can just catch his little hand, take the food out of his hand, take him from the table and tell him that's enough. And he, he, he won't be allowed to finish his meal might be an idea, or you might bring him back to a cold meal after you've had a little talk with him about how disobeying is not God's will. Um, and do you pray together over the meal? I think that would set a good atmosphere to have a nice, quiet, delicious meal. So those are some ideas. My husband can get very angry, get very terse when he's stressed. He has a good heart, works hard, but his words can really bite. I know they aren't meant for me, but yelling and harsh words assault my ears. What to do? Well, you don't say what's stressing your husband. It doesn't seem like it's personal with you. But he must have a lot of anger, too. Um, have you let him know yet that you're stressed out by his yelling and harsh words? If you haven't, do that in a very, uh, again, that's, that's rather confrontive. So you'll want to have three compliments to that confrontation. Let him, let him know how hard you know he's working, how much you appreciate that what a great job he's doing and whatever he's doing a great job in something. And then let him know, I need to talk to you about something that's bothering me. And then let him know about the effect that his words and their harshness has on you. And then do you pray with your husband? Cause he needs some help with his anger, either, either to, to get into a different situation or to deal with anger that's built up in his heart from past experiences. So if you don't pray with him, pray for him until you get your confidence up and then ask him to pray with you. And at first you'll probably do most of the talking if he's not used to it, but that's okay. You, you may need to lead in this, okay? My husband and I go to church, have good friends and supportive family. I just wish he'd take the lead and pray more actively for us, our family and other things. How can I encourage him more? You go to church, have good friends and a supportive family. Hmm. Well, it may just be that you're doing such a fine job of it that he's just content to let you do it. Um, that's the case when a lot of, when it's, when it's a good man, not a lazy man. He may just be unpracticed. Um, well, you just can't be praying with someone. And I think maybe you haven't prayed with him, or if you have, um, you, you maybe are a, a better at speaking than he is. So he just lets you do it, but then you don't get to know his heart. So, but I don't know if, you, do you guys pray together, pray together. And then if, if he lets you do all the praying out loud all the time, you can just look very sweetly and beautifully in his eyes and say, I'd like to hear what's on your heart. Would you pray now? And I think that would be a good start in getting leadership. Then there's times where um, you, you're, you're maybe leading, but he's finishing. Or you may be, uh, there's, there's a meal and you're gone for it. So he has to pray over the meal or, or instruct one of the children to pray, that kind of thing. But just think it through, pray about it and ask God for some ideas. Because if you're a church going lady and you have good friends and a supportive family, you're, you're probably a praying person, I imagine. 
but definitely do pray for him and pray with him and ask God for more ideas because God knows your husband a whole lot better than I do. Okay. Been working hard to pay off my husband's loans. I still have a ways to go. I follow my budget closely. Despite my best efforts, my husband belittles me for taking a loan in the first place. It hurts. Help. Well, I don't know the whole drama you guys have been through. If he tried to discourage you uh, or if this is just something that's happened because uh, money is tight. It looks like you're paying off student loans. So I hope you I hope you got your degree or certification or whatever you needed to get the benefit of that. Um, and I, I think that's how I would work this. But pray and God can give you better answers than me. Um, first of all, you don't need to be belittled. He's your husband and you need to work through this together. You follow your budget. Uh, did you make your budget or did, or did he? Um, ideally, in a perfect world, you would get a degree and then be making a whole lot more money than you were before with the job you had before. That's not always the case. Maybe that's not the case with you, but whatever. I challenge you to make a list of 10 things, 10 benefits that you got from the schooling that you paid tuition for. And it may not be a certification or a degree or even a, uh, a direct line to a better job, but you got something out of it or I don't think you'd have finished it. You might let him know that you're disappointed in some area that he's disappointed to. You certainly don't enjoy being in debt, but just tell him you're working hard and you think it was positive overall and that it will get paid off but you don't want to whine to him about it you want to be strong and i'm not saying confront him uh, but well yeah if he's belittling you you can just say uh that's enough i'd like to talk about this with you seriously but prepare yourself with that list of 10 benefits that you got from school and that'll get your mind thinking i'm because it sounds like maybe you're beating yourself a little bit um or a lot but convince yourself that there was profit in the time and effort and money that you spent on that classwork, even if it's just realizing that you don't like something. I had a girlfriend that that got a, a practically straight A, got a degree in medical. Oh, what do you call that? Medical billing. billing medical. Yeah, I think that's it. And she did very well and she immediately got a job. She was a sharp lady and she absolutely detested it. So she quit that job married her boyfriend and they went, went off to the keys and she was a Kino runner <laughs> and she just loved it. Made good money, liked the hours, had fun, had good friends, but it was not medical billing. Um, so you may be one of those, but you certainly matured some and you learned some things. And in my friend's case, it was what, what it is, what it is not <laughs> that I want. Um, but make a, make a list of those 10 things and then pray and ask God to, to help you with with talking to your husband about belittling you. My wife is thinking of picking up, picking up a part-time job to help with our expenses. It's a point of pride for me that she's able to be at home for our young son. We live by our budget, any cost saving ideas. Well, before I talk about cost saving ideas, cause there are some, um, I'll talk about the part-time job thing. Part-time jobs, I read a book on it once, are great if it's, what is it, the, you need the three S's. You need the salary needs to be adequate for the time and effort you put into it. The status, uh, you don't want to be a part-timer that, that is, it, that is uh, invisible, that you walk in the office and nobody takes you seriously. You want your work to be valued. And number three, the satisfaction. You need to feel like you, you have done something, you've enjoyed something in your job. And if, if a mom can get a part-time job that pays for the sitter or whatever um, and doesn't wreck your schedule and she enjoys it and can come home somewhat re refreshed and enjoying the work, it can work out well and it's no insult to you. Sometimes it's good for a baby or a, is it a young, for a young boy, not a baby, but um, to have someone different in his life. You need to pick that person very carefully. Or maybe if your wife was going to work three hours, two times a week or something, it would just be you and your son who would have time together. So I encourage you to just 
open your mind up a little bit. She's not wanting to desert the family and she's not wanting to seek a career, I don't think. She just is looking for a part-time job. Um, so I think there'd be more benefits than just the money. I'm hearing you say that you provide adequately and you enjoy knowing she's there. So you'd have to partner. And if, if she's working during the day, you'd have to partner in who would come in and take her place. I don't know if you have grandparents. They're usually the best, depending on the grandparents, uh, because they love the kids as much as you do. But you'd want somebody energetic. You'd want somebody certainly trustworthy. And she can't make uh, $10 an hour and have to pay the sitter 11 So you have to work through those issues. But if you could, that might not be a bad thing. You also say, um, oh, you don't mention if you're going to have other children. So if you want to have more children, um, this may be her only time to kind of kind of get out a bit and see what things are like out in the world. Um, but I appreciate you being willing to work full time and let her stay at home with your son. I think that's a wonderful way to work it if you can and if you both agree. Um, now, cost saving ideas, family meetings, family meetings are so wonderful. There's only three of you now and your son's very young or, or young. You didn't say very young. Uh, but just a time every day, often it starts around a meal where you just talk about what you did that day. And then you pray for each other to, to be well physically, to have their heart's desire, to uh, you pray for extended family and friends that might be sick or have an adventure coming up. And then you just talk about things, talk about oh fights that you might have had at work or arguments that you had with a friend or that kind of thing. And you know each other's hearts. And then you can pray into what you know, because you know each other. And it's just kind of fun and cute when you when it'd be the three of you. But if there's going to be more, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the more you add, the more vital it is that you, it doesn't have to be for a whole hour in, in a circle in the living room. It can be for 15 minutes or 10 minutes at the table before the dishes are taken away. That you get to know, go around the circle and let everybody share what they've got on their mind. Oh, that's the first one. Uh, oh, and it saves a lot of money because as the kids get older or even, well, I'll take your situation. You have one young son. How is he feeling? He was fussy that day. Was he sick? What, what got him fussing? That can make the difference in you nipping a, a problem in the bud or letting it get, get larger and larger and larger until it's a crisis. Also, um, things like, oh gosh, my car's in the shop and I don't know how to get someplace. Well, do you need to call Uber or do you have a ride? Transportation is really important, especially with kids. Um, also, meals. Are you making sure that you use, use your leftovers if you go out to eat? Do you clip coupons? Do you go for picnics instead of going to theme parks? That kind of thing. Uh, I've got in my book, I've got a whole article on that. And I've got another one coming up in parenting. But you can save a lot of money with your family meetings. Um, let's see, you've got a young boy. I would say uh, definitely don't put him in expensive sports right now, especially if you're going to have more children. You have five children. They're all in sports that have tuition and special gear and that sort of thing. You just can't. It's an indulgence if you're on a budget. So those are just some ideas. Our daughter has been asking for a devotional to go with her Bible. Well, that's pretty neat. She's 16 and likes to read. My husband would like her to study more with us, but she's independent and wants to learn on her own. Ideas? Boy, I'd, I'd say do both. She's probably pretty busy if she's 16, but she's biblical. Obviously, she wants to learn on her own. You can't make her espouse your values or uh, understand the word of God exactly the way you do. You can't, you can't force that. Um, people argue that we shouldn't have the Bible in school because the children should make up their own minds about that sort of thing. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. How can you make up your mind about something if you don't even know it exists? And I think you have to have a biblical, edu any truly educated person is a biblically educated person. Um, now, I think I can see where it might, might weary her to study with you for an hour and a half where you guys do most of the talking uh, when she could study with friends in a youth group and it 
the talking be more interactive and fun. So if she's going to study with you, dad, I encourage you to make it interactive and make it upbeat and interesting to, to her. Think about yourself at 16. What would have interested you in the Bible? Um, but I think definitely she, she needs to study with others, but I still think it's a good thing. Uh, we also need to refine our study habits. I, I noticed when I was little, the kids would just kind of accept what I, what I had to say because I was the, the biggest voice in their head. But now the biggest voice in their head, if they go to a public school, is, is godless and socialist. So I definitely think, depending on your situation, you keep tabs on that. You keep tabs on that and pray with her. Love her up good. Let her know that you think she's smart. If you have disagreements on your understanding of the word, talk them out. Think it through. Uh, explore it together. Pray about it. And that's what will keep your family strong. Next. My husband is cynical, though he reads the Bible, has been saved. It's almost like he doesn't really trust that God has a plan for his life. <clears throat> the negativity can be so draining. What can I do to help? Yes, negativity can be draining. He's cynical, though he reads the Bible. Well, it sounds like maybe he doesn't believe that God does have a plan for his life. That plan for your life thing, you know, God doesn't micromanage our lives. I think the trust would be that, that he and God can do some things together. And as he, as he reads his Bible and learns what God's will is and prays with you, and learns what God's will is for his life, then he can go along with that and get the peace that comes from that. Um, but it sounds like he's probably going through a rough time right now because you probably wouldn't have married him if he'd been kind of cynical and, and unbelieving. Uh, so anything you can do to get him out and have some fun. And if you have some friends that he likes too, that are, are uh, more upbeat people, that would be really good. Because I, I see that you're feeling, you're feeling his cynicism. Um, if you, uh, if your church, or if, I don't know if you go to church or not, what did you say? He reads the Bible. If you don't go to church, I'd encourage you to find one that you think he'd fit in with. There's all kinds of different personality types out there that need different things. But that would put you in contact with a lot of people uh, that are human just like you are and probably have their own problems. But there's just something wonderful about having a friend to talk to. And obviously, pray together. Do you pray with him now? Uh, I imagine you pray for him, but do you pray with him? And when you pray with him, thank God for the wonderful husband that you have. Thank God for giving him to you and how much you love him and appreciate him, that he's a hard worker, that he's good at this or that or whatever he's good at. And linger a minute at it. Let him hear you thanking God for him. And that's going to open him up more to be able to trust God to believe for something that needs to change in his life. Okay. I'm inspired to start a new business, but I'm having difficulty collaborating with friends to make it happen. How do I protect friendships while I'm still insisting this stuff get done? So it sounds like you've already, I am inspired. Are you starting the business or have you already started it? I'm having difficulty collaborating with friends. How do I protect friendships while still insisting stuff get done? Do you pray with your business buddies? You need to do that anyway because you want your business to be a success. And God is the coordinator and the creator of the entire universe. So he can, he can coordinate the six of you. 
Um, and if some of them are not big praying people, well, they can at least close their eyes or have a moment of silence while you pray. And you say you were inspired to start a new business. Does that mean you're inspired by God or just inspired by um, uh, the, the subject that the business deals with? I mean, both are good. But if, you, if you're inspired by God, you really think God wants you to start a new business, then I would go back to him and ask him for some solutions. And the solution may be that you have to, to let Bob and Jim go and you'd be better off without them. So be open to what God tells you. I would say pray and be open to what God tells you. But I liked your language while insisting, insisting, not commanding or demanding, but insisting that stuff get done. And then, of course, the obvious, if, if they persist in not doing what's expected of them, then you think through what consequences that you have the power to impose. Do they lose work? I mean, do they lose time? Do they get put in, on a different job related to the business? Do they get a warning shot? Um, think through what consequences you have to bear on this issue. And then I would confront them. And again, if you confront, you start off with a compliment. You tell them what, what's wrong in your mind. You tell them what they want to have, ha what you want to have happen. And then what consequences you want to bring to bear. But you've got to, after you've stated what's wrong, you're supposed to stop and listen. So compliment, state what's wrong, stop and listen, then ask, and then uh, bring to bear any consequences if you're at that point with them. Okay. My son, 27, lives at home and has become a hardcore socialist, adamantly, adamantly unemployed. He refuses to, quote, serve capitalist entertainers. Extortioners. Oh, extortioners, right. It's exhausting help. Well, how long are you going to put up with it? It kind of comes down to that. <laughs> are you going to let him stay? I mean, at some point, you'll have to ask him to go or tell him to go. How long has he been there? Um, is he paying you a rent to stay there? Um, <laughs> Mark and I, well, pray, pray about it. Uh, it's, you don't say whether or not you uh, are a dad or a mom or if there's another spouse in the, in the house, but um, adamantly unemployed, huh? Well, you don't believe in sponges. <laughs> So tell him if he's going to be a sponge, he can't stay in your house. <laughs> I wish you well. Yeah, if you have a if you have a spouse in the home, pray with them, and pray about it, and and ask yourself, how long am I willing to tolerate this? He's spitting in your face, and and dish rags don't usually get much respect, but do what you must do. And I, I don't know the whole situation, so. Those are just my thoughts on it. And I just encourage you to pray. And I'm laughing um, because to probably to anybody but you, they would think, get that, that sponge out of your house. But you, you love the boy. You've raised him. And he needs a place to stay. And you don't want him to stay out on the street. We're called enablers. <laughs> I, I had a, a situation where somebody that I dearly loved uh, had a drug problem. And... Uh, We'd let him go to jail for a while. He was in jail over Christmas holidays one time. And uh, we'd got, gone to rehab and I'd visited him. And, and uh, I was helping him get into a very, very upscale uh, and supposedly very successful uh, drug dealing. What do you call it? A drug unit center. And I started by saying, I'm the last enabler he's got. And I'm tired. <laughs> Um, but I knew I was an, an enabler. I knew that I, I was, but the, the, uh, the alternative was for him to be in jail or for him to be dangerous. I mean, he could be dangerous to himself. So, uh, that, that's what I did. So, um, it is serious. It's not a laughing matter, but you have to pray and be right about this. You've got to, to know whatever happens, 
that you did the best thing that you thought would, would be for him as well as for you. Okay, next. I'm sick a lot and losing interest in life. Oh. I feel my apathy is fueling my sickness. How do I break out of this cycle? Well, I feel like you've probably tried and weren't able to pull it off. Well, who, who have you got? Who have you got that you think is wise? Who, who have you got that's strong? You need to, you've probably been praying for yourself, I imagine. But you need to get a prayer partner at the very least. And then what God tells you to do, excuse me, what God tells you to do, do it. And in your local area, there are pe people that, that treat depression. And you don't say what your sickness is, but a lot of them have their own special support groups. And you think, gosh, boy, somebody else is going through this too. And you'll automatically feel better. Um, just good old rule of thumb things, losing interest in life. I don't, if you're sick a lot, you probably, your diet probably isn't real fun. But you have to be wise about that. Um, do the obvious, watch funny movies. If you can laugh, you can do yourself a lot of good regardless. Um, don't drink too much or maybe even drink at all with your medications. Check your medications. Make sure that that's not causing part of this. And if, if you can get off some or change some or even reduce some, that would make a difference. Play wonderful music that you enjoy. Uh, I don't know what kind of music you enjoy. I enjoy different musics at different times. What, what lifted me up one time will annoy me the next. <laughs> Um, but music is, is one of those things that just takes you immediately to a different place. Uh, and I'm sorry you're sick, but there's more life for you. So start with a prayer partner, talk to God, do what God tells you to do. Got another one back there, John? Mm -hmm. My husband is exhausted all the time. He stays up late even when I advise him to sleep. <laughs> what can I do to get through to him? You don't say how old you are or why your husband is exhausted. I imagine you pray for him, but do you pray with him? You advise him to sleep. Have you gotten very close to him and looked him right in the eye and told him how much you love him and how concerned you are about his fatigue and that he's not able to sleep? Because when I'm exhausted, I can, I can sleep. I have no problem. Just, just give me 30 seconds and a couch and I'll be out. But he's exhausted all the time and then stays up late. So th there's something in his heart. There's something bothering him. So how to get through to him. You need to pray for him and pray with him. And then believe God to give you an answer. There are people that can treat that. Or maybe he just needs a friend. Or um, maybe he has some problem with you that he can't verbalize or he feels like he can't. Maybe you've just gotten into a rut, but the, exha the exhaustion concerns me. Pray with him and pray for him and then do what God tells you to do. There'll be an answer there. Money is tight due to COVID, reducing my hours. And I am stressed. What can I do to reduce my stress and generate more income with no college degrees? <clears throat> Well, I don't know where you live. I'm in Orlando, Florida, or just north of there, actually. I'm Seminole County, but there's all kinds of work out there. It's not, uh, some of it isn't um, executive type salaries, but it's something. Um, I don't know where you are, but we're praying and believing for the country to open up. So that should be, be settled pretty soon. But you don't need to have a college degree for a lot of good jobs out there. Think more private businesses maybe than, than uh, corporate things or um, private services especially. I think lawn care guys get like 20 bucks an hour. 
uh, house cleaning maids get $40 an hour sometimes. There are jobs that, that maybe don't have a lot of status, but you can bring down some pretty good money. Um, and they're, they're, they can be fun. Um, so what can you do to reduce your stress? Um, well, you need to get some money coming in. That would reduce your stress. I would not worry about a college degree. Um, now, I mentioned house cleaning and lawn care. Maybe you're, I, I don't know what, how old you are either, so you probably don't want to be doing house cleaning and lawn care if you're 69. Um, but I, I, I would encourage you to expand your horizons on what you've done before and what you might do. There are counselors out there that will give you an, um, an interest inventory as well as a competence inventory on what you can do and what you have done. And will suggest jobs that you didn't know were jobs. You didn't really people get paid to do that. And that can be something to look for, look to. Uh, employment counseling would be the title that that's under. And um, it, it might be kind of expensive, but if it can get you a job in a week instead of six months, it would be worth it. Um, keep your health good. Keep your health good. Your stress, that's not good for your health. Make sure you keep eating well. Make sure that you sleep well. Feed yourself good things in your ears and your eyes as well as your mouth. Watch positive movies, encouraging movies. Um, listen to upbeat music. Uh, take naps if you need to take naps. Don't feel guilty about that. Um, and then pray. You don't say if you're single or if you're in a family or if you even have a spouse. But if you can pray with with anybody do it but get yourself a prayer partner are you in church church is also a fabulous place to meet people and just let people know that you're available and what you can do um and there's little churches and then there's great big churches but but nose around that way that's a wonderful way to meet people and the people that you meet usually love god like you do um but i'm sorry about your job it's hitting so so many people but uh, as President Trump has said, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. So, so I would say explore church if you haven't. Definitely, definitely pray for yourself and with somebody else, at least one person. If you can get two or three prayer partners, that'd be good. Um, don't worry about the college degree right now. I know a lot of people think, well, I'm not working, so I'll just go to college. So great. Instead of being $30,000 in debt, I'm in college. I, I couldn't stay anymore. And now I'm $60,000 in debt. So, um, you know, unless if God tells you to go to college, go to college. If somebody offers you a scholarship, do it. But but to think of that as a knee jerk answer to being out of work, it doesn't make sense. OK. My neighbor does not care at all that there is literally trash constantly in their front yard. I want the neighborhood to be a blessing <clears throat> when I drive home. Short of being their trash man, what to do? That's so funny you mentioned that. I think for probably maybe three years, we had neighbors that, that would just leave their, their little tumbler, what do you call it, the dumpster, in the road and, and things might blow out of it and they'd leave it there. And my husband just every, you know, Thursday and, and Sunday or Thursday and Saturday, when was it? Monday and Thursday, I guess. He would take take his dumpster back to the back of the house and he would take the neighbors back to their house and pick up any trash that was there. And I said, I said, do you always do the neighbor's trash? Aren't they responsible for their own trash? And he just said, it's bothering me and it's not bothering them. So that's, that's the way he handled it. Um, so I don't know that it also, they didn't grow. They didn't become more observant and more courteous when he did, though they would say thank you when he did. Uh, now the, the neighbor across the cul-de-sac really, really appreciated Dale for doing this. And hey, thank you. Thanks, man. Well, the place looks so much better. You do that all the time. Um, but part of it is that it's in the dumpster probably when you leave for work. And when you get back is when it's all over the front yard. So it sounds like a, a very friendly, gentle confrontation could be good there. 
are you okay with confrontation? Is that something you can do? And again, the, the basic formula is start with a compliment. Tell them what the problem is, how you feel about it, and wait. Usually at that point, they'll interrupt and say, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'll be better about that. And you can thank them and then, and then see if he does it. If he doesn't follow through on it, then the very next time say, are you okay? Are the kids okay? You, well, you just said you were going to pick up the trash and then, and then the trash is still out there. So I was wondering if you were okay. But if you can get them to agree with it, you're halfway there anyway. Okay, next. I'm interested in learning more about the Bible. But none of the churches do much more than generic praise and worship. Light on real and worship. I'm missing a word. Praise and worship. Oh, it is light on real meaty scripture. What do you recommend? Well, do you have some friends that you think are real sharp that have a good grasp of the Bible? I would ask them what they're doing. Uh, sounds like you'd like to learn with a group um and you might ask the pastor of of the next church who does does he know of a group that that's doing a bible study in blah you know what what you're especially interested in um gosh there's a, there's so many really good study groups out there but i don't know where you live what area you're in and um, God's really interested in you learning his word as well. So definitely pray about that and ask God to put you in just the right group. that will be stimulating and fun and uh, godly that they, they don't have Sunday morning faces and then their regular faces. But that's a good thing that you want to do. That's good that you're interested in learning about the Bible and being truly educated. Um, and the, the praise and worship is, is wonderful, too. But I'm hearing you say that that's not your your big need right now. You want meaty scriptures and they're there. And until until you find that group, just pick up the Bible and read it, read it, read it, read it. You can also go to many, many Bible bookstores and they'll they've got commentaries. Um, that's why you probably want to get with one of your good friends and, and get an idea of what that what a good commentary is to them. Um, I've got. Uh, Bullinger is one of my favorites, but he's not as well known as some others. But there are some people, uh, J. Sidlow Baxter. Oh, yes. J. Sidlow Baxter is amazing. Um, and you can buy them on Amazon used for 10, 12 bucks, whatever. But he, he could really get you started well. Um, but it's a good thing that you want to do. So pray and ask God to give you the best for just what you're looking for. Okay. I would like fulfillment in my life. Yes, yes, go for it. But I feel directionless. I dropped out of college due to a lack of funding and I'm about 13,000 in debt because of it. What should I do? Well, I say again, college is not the be all end all of getting where you want to go. You know, some people do, you know, they know what they want to be when they grow up and they get the, the schooling for it. They get that degree, that key that unlocks doors and they go get work. I think that's probably about 10 percent. <laughs> um, you dropped out for lack of funding. Oh, that's so huge because the, the funding is ridiculous. What we pay for colleges and what we get out of these colleges is ridiculous. Um, find out what you want to do and then learn what it'll take to get there. Uh, if you want to be a surgeon, I don't know how old you are now, but if you want to be a surgeon, you better be prepared for that to be your life. Um, and you'll work for it, and then you may start being a surgeon at age, I don't know how old you are, 40 or 50. And it'll be worth it to you because that'll have been your dream. But it will also be very, very, very expensive. I would recommend that you figure out what you want to do and then learn about that field. And, and the different positions within the same field that you can have, because one of them may pay twice as much, uh, but you have to pay twice as much to get the college education to get that one. So it's worth thinking it through like that. Um, I know people hold up, oh, if you go to college, you'll get a good job. And it's just not true. So so don't let the college sway you any way at all. Sit down, figure out what you what you would enjoy doing. 
Do you like to be outdoors? Do you like to be with people or do you like to be alone? Uh, you don't want to deal with whether I don't want to be outdoors. Do I want to, do I want to be handled by people or do I want to, to manage people? Uh, it, am I artsy? Am I scientific? Am I mathematical? Um, and just write down everything about, about the day. What would you like for your day to be like? And then if you can find a career counselor, uh, they can be worth their weight in gold to get you pointed in the right direction. So wish I could help you more. That's very frustrating. My boyfriend has trouble opening up to me and I feel he may have deep emotional damage from a previous relationship. How do I help him open up? I don't know how long you've been together. And I don't know what makes you think he's not opening up. Deep emotional damage. Well, have you asked him about that? I mean, if he's a serious boyfriend uh, and he has deep emotional damage, you need to, you need to get that assessed because you don't want to marry somebody that has deep emotional damage unless they're well, well along in the process of getting that taken care of. Um, do you pray with him? I think that would help him learn to trust you as, as you pray and, and God's not going to tell you something and then tell him something that would contradict that in any way. But you're, he's a boyfriend. He's not a husband. So I think you're in a position where you need to help him if you can. Um, but you need to assess that relationship and see if that's one that you want to just be a friendship relationship rather than tying your kite to his kind of thing. But certainly praying with him and for him would be the bedrock advice. All right, and we're coming up on our last question for our time hour. Let's see. What is your ultimate wind down at wind down activity? What really brings you peace after a long day? Hmm. I don't have one because different things do different things. Sometimes to watch a silly movie, uh, it would never be to watch like a thriller or a, uh, a lot of um, set, what FX uh, murders or whodunits or that sort of thing. But sometimes a, a funny movie. Sometimes there, there are several Bible teachers that I really like that will just get me excited about what they're working. Um, wind down activity. I think probably those two movies and music and sometimes just a nice walk, kind of stretch, move things out, get ready for bed. I hate to end on that, but <laughs> that's what well, I do. We actually have a, have a little bit of time, so we'll do one more fun bonus question. Oh, okay. There's an uh, uplifting one. Who in your life would you consider one of the most positive influences? Who do you respect most that you have met and why? Most positive influences. Mm -hmm. Gosh, there's so many, so many. Probably my husband, Dale, most positive influence. Who do you respect the most that you have met Oh, probably my husband, Dale. And why? Um, why do I respect him? Oh, because so he's... Wise. What? So wise. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Because he is uh, faithful and smart and he loves God as much as I do. And he'll always pray with me. And he loves the children as much as I do. And he can fix everything in the world. He'll either fix it or break it to where it won't get fixed. And he's funny. And he's always been there for me. And 
this victim that you've met in a while. And he is patient. How about that? We all done? Uh, Janice wanted to give you some love. Oh, hi, Janice. All right. Okay, we'll end with a word of prayer. Well, thank you, Father, for oh, giving me a time to just share and, and think about things that are going on with people. I ask you, Father, to help me get a bead on things that are useful and practical and not just an opinion. I ask you, Father, to work with the people that wrote these questions and heal their hearts, inspire them, give them joy, and an always solution-oriented kind of a process as they work through the problems in their lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.